coming up 78 Denver, take one. Steve, Walker. Well, a lot of questions that I've had this week as we've traveled around and visited some of the studios and so on is, what's happening with the spectrum? Where are we going? There's a lot of rumors. The FCC just recently released another proposed rulemaking. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the current state of things and clarify a couple of terms that are getting bandied about. One of them is the, the, the two biggies are stacking and packing. Stacking a uh, digital transmission is when the FCC, what the FCC wants to do is liberate more spectrum for white space devices. And they're looking at it from a couple of uh, attack points. And the current prominent one is stacking transmissions. They are talking to the broadcasters, the terrestrial broadcasters, and asking them to stack their transmissions onto a common carrier. For example, in Albuquerque, New Mexico right now, the public television transmission carries four channels. There's 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. They are all PBS. But there is nothing to bar uh, these uh, stations from combining their transmissions on a single transmitter. So you would have on uh, 5.1, you would have ABC, and 5.2, you would have N uh, CBS, and then Fox, and so on. There's no reason that can't be done, except, of course, the broadcasters have to agree to do this. And the FCC is asking that this be done voluntarily. They are dangling a financial incentive to the broadcasters about this by saying, if you do it, we'll share the proceeds of the results of the lease auction that we will hold to auction off this spectrum. So for a struggling TV station, this could be quite a temptation. And in fact, many stations now are dealing with the cost of the added uh, burden of digital broadcasting, which is primarily power consumption. To get the same coverage for a given area, they're having to put a lot more power into their transmitters for digital than they did for analog. In the case of Albuquerque, the, where they used to be able to cover with 15,000 watts, now they need 50,000 watts. Well, you know, that's going to impact the power bill at the end of the month. So there's incentive for them, but I don't know that it's enough incentive. But here's the good news about that. What they're talking about doing is taking away spectrum from a terrestrial broadcast, that's a current on-air digital broadcast, and then allocating it for use by something else. You already can't use that spectrum. It's already in use. It's already really off limits to you now. So a restacking or stacking of transmissions is not going to negatively impact the available spectrum you currently have. And that's the thing to really keep clear. It's not going to take away available spectrum. The thing that we do have to think about is the white space devices. That's a separate issue. White space devices are also being called super Wi-Fi. And the goal of the manufacturers that want to get this out on the market is to use these white space devices. They're going to be routers. They'll even be, uh, they will even want to incorporate that spectrum into a next generation of cell phones. And there's going to be two versions available. There will be the fixed white space devices, which can have up to four watts of power, but they are going to dwell at 512 megahertz and lower. And those units are fixed. They're in a fixed location, like a router. So if you've got, you know, if you've got a modest country home with 43 acres and you want to cover all that so you can sit with your laptop down by your duck pond, you can cover it with using one of those routers. It'll give a lot more range than the current round range of 2.5 gigahertz gear. But it has to be geolocation smart. It has to go out once a day. The fixed devices once a day have to go out onto the network, go to the national database, and check to see if there are any licensed wireless microphones in operation within one kilometer. And if they are, they have to vacate that entire TV channel and move to another TV channel. And that's where the database becomes important. That's where licensing becomes important. The portable devices are lower in power, a maximum of 100 milliwatts. And they could be a cell phone. They could be a, a, a link on a laptop. Uh, those devices are required to check the internet every minute because they're portable, they're moving. So if they move from uh, Joe Blow's Bar and Grill and then they want to go over to a, a local theater that's got a bunch of wireless microphones that are registered, as they walk in the door of the theater, 
their cell phone checks and says, I'm now using location services, I'm in this spot, and then it'll say, no, you can't use this TV channel, this TV channel, or that TV channel. So that, again, it's checking the national database. And that leads to the important question. Are you getting your licenses? Are you getting your wireless microphone licenses? You guys, as motion picture and television content developers, are allowed to get a Part 74 license under the FCC regulations. You can be a licensed user. And there's a process in place. And if you don't want to deal with the FCC, and I can understand why, the form is, is, was written probably, the original form was probably written in the 30s. And it asked for uh, things that apply to wireless microphones like the height of the antenna transmitter. Well, you know, this next production, we're using midgets. Is that two feet? So uh, it becomes important to understand what you're filling out. There are people willing to help you. Bill Ruck up in San Francisco will help. Or you've got uh, um, What's uh, Bill Ruck in uh, San Francisco. <laughs> And uh, then we've got Henry Cohen at Production Radio Rentals in New York that will also do it. He does it for a turnkey operation of about $500 to do this for you. But he'll do it turnkey. He'll do all of it for you. Bill will give you assistance for about, I think, about $100, bucks, And you pay all the license fees, which right now is about $150. But when you get your license, you then have the ability to go to this national database and say, Tomorrow morning we are shooting down at Hollywood and Vine and I'm going to use these TV channels. And then your stuff shows up on the database and any white space device within a kilometer of that is going to vacate those TV channels. You have priority. You will actually bump those devices out of it. Now my goal, personal goal, is to entirely ruin the business model for white space devices. I'm going to be perfectly happy if a guy goes into Fry's, buys a white space router, takes it home, turns it on, and the first thing it tells him on his laptop is no spectrum available because three of you guys live nearby and you've got him just buried. That will ruin the business model for white space devices, and if Fry's gets enough returns, they're going to stop stocking them and they're not going to be an issue. And there are enough of you out there to blanket Southern California. Now, a year ago, we talked about this and we, uh, we, we said start registering, and people are doing it, and if you haven't done so, please do so. It's important. We've got, for example, Warner Brothers now has all their wireless microphones, and you go on the database, there's all these little blue dots all over the Warner lot, and when they go on location, you can actually change your location on the fly. You just do it on the internet. You go on, it takes just a few minutes, you know, make it a favorite on your Explorer bar and click on it, and go in and say, okay, here's the location I'm going to be in. I, and it doesn't matter where. And when you do that, it'll tell you what TV channels are available. Around the country now, there are two TV channels in every region that are exclusive for wireless microphones. And then all of the other Part 74 channels are also available to you as licensed users. You had an online question. Uh, well, it wasn't a question. I just wanted to let everybody know if you're curious about getting your licensing, I have a guide next door that I can give you. So uh, Outstanding. Uh, see good. me when we're all done. Outstanding. We'll let you have a fake wire, little wireless microphone for that. <laughs> awesome. This is important because the biggest problem we've had in the past is the lack of visibility. Now, the FCC is waking up to this. In fact, Carl has been having a lot of conversations with the vice deputy of the FCC. Yeah, he's the, uh, the deputy chief engineer of, uh, of the FCC. If you look at the organizational chart for the FCC, that's second down on the tree. And he's been calling and talking with Carl personally. The FCC is finally becoming aware of the fact that they have been so preoccupied with content delivery in the spectrum they've omitted to think about content development in the spectrum. And they're finally getting enough shouting and yelling from the people that are developing content. The Super Bowl kind of got their attention, you know? Did you realize these rules are gonna ruin the Super Bowl? Did you realize we're not gonna be able to do television shows? Did you realize news is gonna fall flat on its face? Finally, they're becoming aware of it and we're seeing a heightened awareness at the FCC. But what they really need to see is that map fill up with the little blue dots showing where your wireless microphones are in use. And we don't want you to spectrum squat. We don't want you to get your license and then just go in and fill up spaces on the map. Be honest about your usage. 
Trust me, there's enough of you out there that you will flood a large part of the United States, not just Southern California, although this should just be a solid blue mass by the time we're done. <laughs> but even in uh, New Mexico, there's a lot of production going on there. The more they see, because when they started developing these rules, the FCC honestly thought there were only 993 wireless microphones in use in the US. And we are getting our attention, they're paying attention to this. Now there's a new ruling that was just recently released in September 19th that allowed unlicensed users to register on the database. But they're under a large number of rules that they have to fulfill before they can even begin to do so. And it's aimed at things like the Lincoln Center and a Broadway play where they're doing 50 wireless microphones. But there's a lot of rules, so don't sit back and say, well, I'll just go under the unlicensed regulations because that'll work against you. First of all, unlicensed, you're limited to 50 milliwatts, no more. The Lincoln Center cannot use a 100 milliwatt transmitter. Broadway cannot use a 100 milliwatt transmitter. You can, but only if you have a license. The, um, you are limited to filling up first. You have to make maximum use of the exclusive channels, the ones reserved for wireless microphones, first. So you have to have a whole bunch of wireless in those two TV channels, and they're asking for a minimum of eight channels in FM and a minimum of 14 channels in digital. You have to fill those channels. Then any additional channels that you wish to register, you have to fill one TV channel at a time. So there's a lot of rules that are going to be enforced upon these unlicensed users before they can register on the database. Hey, Gordon, can I make a comment real quick? Yeah. So uh, if you're interested in knowing where these safe haven channels are in your local area, uh, on our website, there's a page in the, uh, there's a page on the website that's FCC updates and spectrum issues. And on there, there's a PDF that shows exactly that, how the spectrum is used in 13 major markets, including Los Angeles. It shows you where these safe haven channels are. These are, there's two TV channels in every major market set aside for exclusive use by wireless microphones. So go to electrosonics.com, look up the FCC spectrum issues page, and you'll find that PDF there. It was actually originally prepared by our New York rep, Howard Kaufman. He put that information together. But I found it very useful when I'm talking to people on the phone about the famous question we get all the time, what blocks are good for wherever I'm going to be? Boise, Idaho, Chicago, Boston, New York, Los Angeles. This is a great place to look on that chart because it'll show you, first of all, which block has the safe haven channels in it and which blocks have low to no DTV use in it. And of course, Los Angeles has a lot of red in this chart, as you'll see. There's a lot of TV channels that are blocked out but not all, and you'll actually get a good idea which blocks are, are viable for your area. Gordon, Bob Baker has a Hi. Um, in terms of the law of unintended consequences, um, I work on a particular lot kind of under the radar. If I now become a licensed um, operator, how does that cooperator conflict with whatever their um, priorities are? It's kind of like the visual flight rules for the FAA. It's a non-interference. Uh, Basically, you cooperate with the, the lot. If you cause an interference problem for the lot and you're a licensed user, well, so are they in theory. You work it out between each other. That just becomes a, you know, sitting down and saying, look, you know, you're causing trouble over here in this set. You need to change. Nothing really changes the way you've been doing things. But because you're a licensed user, you have the right to make that negotiation. If you don't have a license, you have no rights. You will, you will then have to bow to whatever they ask you to do. So that's a great question, Bill, thank you. Now, another thing that you wanna pay attention to on uh, your uh, spectrum allocations is when you do go on location and you go out of, into the boondocks, how do you find out about that? We'll post up on our website, and I don't think it's there yet, but we'll, we'll do it when I get back. We'll post up the link to the Spectrum Bridge database, and I'll put a little video up on how to look up what's in the area using their database. So at least you can see what the available exclusive channels are, what the available open TV channels are, and what are the white space channels. And right now, white space devices are not ubiquitous. They've only just been recently released in the Northeast. And the same thing applies for the unlicensed users registering. They're only allowing it in the Northeast United States. 
I think if they fought in the war, the Revolutionary War, they're allowed to, to register there, but <laughs> the rest of us are going to wait. It's an experiment that they're conducting right now. So um, the recent uh, uh, ruling on the uh, unlicensed stuff, I think, is not going to impact us very much. Now, there was a new issuance just on October 5th, and I haven't studied it very carefully yet. And it's now we get to the other term, and that's repacking. Now the FCC is saying, we'd like to slide all that spectrum down and pack the TV channels even tighter than they are now. But it's a proposed rulemaking. And it's going to be a long time. My figure, probably 10 to 12 years before we see any real action on that. But it's something we'll be keeping an eye on. And I know the broadcasters are going to be objecting to it. I know the sports uh, arenas are going to be objecting to it. And naturally, you're going to see a lot of pushback from all the other wireless microphones, the touring groups and everything. I think they're going to have a tough time pushing that through. To give you an idea how long it takes to go from a proposed rulemaking to actual action, I have in my desk the original proposed rulemaking for the transition to digital TV. Now, that occurred finally on June 19, 2009. That's when we actually made the switch over. The proposed rulemaking was in April of 1995. So it took from 1995 till 2009 just to make the DTV transition. And I can tell you the DTV, the transmitters, the broadcasters are still smarting from that expense. That was a highly costly changeover. They had to change their transmitters. They had to change their power lines. They had to change their studios. It was expensive. It took a long time. And they're not going to be too friendly to any changes where the guy says, OK, just kidding about using channel 36. We want you to go to 32. So I think there's going to be a lot of pushback. So there's no need to panic. Any products that you own and use today or buy today is going to be in good use for the next seven to eight years, no problem. That's our prognostication at this point. And of course, I don't know if it'll really get any worse than it is, but we're certainly keeping an eye on it. Questions? All right, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Uh, it's um, information like that that uh, just another reason that we like Electrosonic so much. Uh, we've, we've been working together, I've calculated, Gordon, uh, 22 years now. 22 years, my friend. Uh, but uh, a true audio in, in Electrosonics. So I've known Gordon that long. You're, you're my first contact in Nashville. He came by to visit and signed us on. It's been great ever since. So. Um, Th thanks, everybody, for coming over. And I want to thank the online audience, too, for participating. It's, it's always a big help. I learn, I learn as much as anyone for, at, at these, these events.